Oh, now I have to stop being, be nice now. Hi, Matthew. Hi, how's it going? Well. Yeah. Hi, Janice. Long time no speak. I know, it's been like 30 seconds. I was texting <laughs> Janice about stuff. Anyways. <laughs> All right. Oh, share screen. Okay. Are you good? Yeah. Can you yeah. share your screen? Fantastic. Yep. So can you see my screen? We can. Do you want to start now, Janice, or do you want to wait a few Oh, it's minutes? up to you. I it's not um you... because uh, the format that Matthew had discussed with me was having mm -hmm. a lot of opportunity for dialogue. Right. I, I think I have about 15 slides. Like I really don't. Oh, know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, up to, up to you, Matthew, what do you think? Should we begin? Maybe i uh, give it another like two minutes or so. Yeah. Just okay. We're, we're still it. getting there. All I right. think uh, the snow threw a lot of people <laughs> I off have no today doubt. and the commute I'm sure is yeah. uh, intense. I saw a lot of traffic around today. Yeah. Certainly from my kitchen to my office, that was hard. Mm. Lots of snow there. Yeah, oh, really, eh? <laughs> you had to put your snowshoes on? I'm, I'm I had to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm an awful parent because my son grows like a weed. And this morning we go, we go oh, no, his bow boots don't fit. So anyway. Fun. He had shoes. He's all right. There you go. <laughs> He'll survive. How many people are we expecting? I'm, I'm, we had about uh, 15 questions sent in, but that doesn't necessarily everyone's going to be able yeah. to make it. Oh, but we're all, people yeah. are coming in. That's great. Yeah. Um, since these are recorded, uh, what's cool is that people come back and they do watch them on yeah. YouTube. So even if everyone's not here, it's not. Oh, excuse me. Let this call. Okay. I don't know if you guys want to do a tour de table and tell me where you where you each work. Yeah, that's that's a great idea, Janice. I uh, not everybody's name is labeled. I see Nancy Peterson. Hi, I'm, I work for the Western Quebec School Board in a small centre in Shawville. Uh, teach a range of subjects and a range of levels. So that's who I am. And is it is it with uh, adult sector special needs or uh, regular? Uh, we have a SIS program and we have academic students as, uh, who are looking for their high school diploma. Okay. So our SIS program runs two days a week. Okay. And Giovanna? Hi. So Giovanna Salvaggio, I also go by Joanne. I, um, up until last month, I was a RECI um, regional services with the Anglophone community, and now I've transitioned. I still have the RECI role, but I serve the uh, First Nations and Inuit community. Super. We can learn. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Stephanie B. Hi, um, I work at Place Cartier and I am, along with the other Stephanie that's in here, half of the teaching team that teaches the SVI program Thrive, and we integrate the SI curriculum as well. Okay, super. Other Stephanie, do you want to introduce yourself or you're okay? Yeah. Um, well, exactly what Steph said, but hi, happy to be hi. here. <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, Matthew, I know. I, I don't know if everybody knows Matthew, but how can you not know Matthew? <laughs> well, I mean, I this the, I think this is the first time I've met Nancy. So, oh. and there's someone else, uh, Monjour. So, I'll I'll go ahead. Um, Matthew Kennedy, I'm a pedagogical consultant at Lester B for the adult sector, and my dossiers are social integration and sociovocational integration. 
Thank you. And Monjur? Yes, good afternoon or good evening. <clears throat> this is Monjur from Nemeska. I'm in the adult section. Yes, adult ed in Nemeska. And can you tell me a little bit about what Nemeska is? Well, Nemeska is one of those uh, communities in Northern Quebec. Okay. And uh, there are, you know, both the uh, youth sector and uh, and adult sector. I'm a math teacher in adult sector. <clears throat> I did teach last year high school. Wonderful. Thank you. Amanda? Hi, I'm Amanda. Um, I also teach at Cartier with the Endeavor program. And uh, I spent part of my time teaching in the building and the other part of my time teaching at a CROM day program. Cool. Um, and I see there's a DKG QC. Sorry, that's me. That's Trace. Oh, okay. I forgot to log out of my Zoom from something else. But anyway, uh, I'm Tracy. I teach SI at the Douglas um, for um, adults, mostly males, 18 and older, who are not criminally responsible because of a psychosis. I think we've met before. Um, I haven't figured out where everybody is, so I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And I think we've covered everybody except Mark. Mark Garapi. I am a provincial service for CAGE. And what's AGE? I come AGE from is adult Health general State. education. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I don't know, but I think my mini bio is available somewhere. Um, but I'm uh, Janice Bichet Jarvis. I'm currently a manager at uh, the West Island CIUS in the Intellectual Disability, Autism Spectrum Disorder, and Physical Disability Directorate. Um, I'm one of the two managers in the uh, work integration and community integration sectors, where we have between 30 and 35 addresses that range from um, day programs, workshops, uh, workstations, individual uh, stages, and we're um, focusing a lot on paid employment as part of a ministry directive as well. Um, my area of expertise as a former educator was uh, in the workstation area. I was an educator for about almost 20 years um trying to help people find volunteer placements or stages leading to paid employment and since i've become a manager i've uh, developed a new strength i hope in working with clients with severe challenging behaviors and i manage uh, two three programs now um, in partnership uh, one in partnership um, with the english montreal school board on site at one of their schools uh, where we have uh, an interesting new venture that started this year, and the other two are housed in our day programs. So we're doing a, a sharing of expertise in two addresses. One of them is our address and one belongs to English Montreal School Board. And the third address is at this point exclusively um, a, a CROM, a former CROM facility. So we're, we used to be called CROM and now we're the West Island Integrated Health and Social Services Center. Uh, should I start, Matthew? Yeah, and Janice, you've done some teaching too, right? Just because we've oh, got I teachers have. in the room here. And, yeah, um, yeah, I, I um, was really lucky that um, at one point in time, and I, I wish that I had continued it, and I, now that COVID is hopefully, although with my COVID numbers in my programs, not sure it's going down, but yes, I was hired as a teacher for the special care counseling and early childhood education department at LaSalle College. Um, so I have uh, taught there and I've also done stage supervision, um, which I find really, really fun and fascinating because I've learned about all different uh, service delivery organizations for people with a variety of needs and um, and it's been really interesting for me and it's helped me grow uh, as a professional as well. So uh, unfortunately, I had to take a, a step back during COVID because our whole service model changed. And now that we're reopening at probably 90%, um, maybe I'll have the time to give to developing courses and, um, and teaching again, because I, I really did enjoy that. 
did I forget anything else, Matthew? No, I, I think that's good. And I just like to, you know, I, I think it's um, nice for the teachers in the room to know that. Um, but also we have we have had a lot of special care counselors or counselors in training um, from various programs uh, at Endeavor, but I know, uh, I think we've had some of the Douglas with Tracy too, and I know at the Action Center. So um, it's 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 good to know that they're being taught by, you know, um, skilled people such as yourself. And um, I, I think that's, you know, one, one of the reasons that, uh, you know, we, we've had so many great stash students. So yeah, so just a nice little connection there. Super, yeah, and I have to say that we, well, I'm sure you do the same, but we love having stash students, um, and it is a fast track for hiring if they, if they've learned our system and if they are working out well, um, we certainly try to fast track them to be hired once they've completed even 50% of their special care counseling, they can start working with us. Um, and I, I see part of our mandate just as a connection again with school boards. Um, the ministry has, has also asked that readaptation centers and that the CUS is that part of our responsibility is to support in community and other settings. So if we have a client, in my case, a client with a special need, um, we are responsible to help support the community organizations. It can be through forums like this, like giving a PowerPoint, it can, and if there's a client with more of a crisis situation, it can be to help give intervention support to, to support the team in terms of developing tools and, um, and even participating. We've been asked in the past to uh, participate in pedagogical uh, presentations to the teaching teams. So uh, we've had those requests from uh, Lester B and from EMSB which both fall in part on our territory. And that's also part of our mandate as social integration teachers that's in the, the current program and the new program it explicitly stated that we're meant to be working with um, our partners in the community and health and social services sector to connect our students with resources, but also just to help them navigate them. So I'm glad that that messaging is sort of, you know, happening on both sides. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, uh... I think it's beneficial for the for the person, right? For the client or the student, because in ultimately we don't want to contradict each other, and we want to make sure that we're cohesive in terms of um, supporting the messages, but also in terms of um, not sending somebody to a million and one different places to get the support they need. So I think those links are really important and. With our other hats on, Matthew, I do have a lot of that communicating that we do uh, through the West Island local table as well. We both sit on that table. Okay, so I'll, I'll continue the, oh, I'll start the presentation only because um, I want to leave time for you guys for some brainstorming at the end because I think that most of this session was uh, supposed to be devoted to brainstorming. About a year ago, I was asked to present on um, anxiety and what tools we use um, for, for people that have severe challenging behaviors. And I condensed um, a lot of information into one presentation to really um, give an idea of how macro we look at supporting a person. Uh, but this time around, I'm going to channel it a little bit more into focusing on anxiety. I realize now that um, not all of the, the students that you work with have special needs, but I think the strategies are really um, able to be used no matter, um, because some of the people that we work with don't have an intellectual disability and they do have a diagnosis of autism. Um, and so you may have students with other learning challenges um, and these strategies should work for them as well. So it's really a broad stroke. It's not, uh, and, and just with some ideas of uh, what tends to be tried and true. And so we'll, we'll go. So the APA definition of anxiety is that it's an emotion, anxiety is an emotion that's characterized by feelings. Um, usually tension, people can have worried or perseverative thoughts, and they can also experience uh, physical changes in their, in their body, like increased blood pressure. Um, they usually have recurring in, intrusive thoughts or concerns. They may avoid situations because they're anxious about them or worried, and 
we'll talk a little bit next about what those physical symptoms could look like. So what do you guys think? What do you think that it can feel like to have anxiety? Um, maybe just open a mic and go ahead. Tracy, think, go ahead. I think it's um, overwhelming, I, like, a, like a, a feeling for some people that is, they feel so overwhelmed that they, that they, they're paralyzed. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, you can get like very, very restless. Yep. Absolutely. Physiological things like uh, uh, increased heart rate, um, uh, shortness of breath, even. Yeah. Or you, you can feel it in your, yeah. System kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe also that it feels like frustrating because you know, sometimes I think people have an awareness that what they're feeling doesn't match reality, but they ha can't control the physical reaction they're having to a situation. Yeah. You can even feel like your skin is crawling. Like you just want to get out of your skin. Uh, especially if you're having a panic attack, like that feeling is, is, is huge in terms of um, heart rate, breathing, sweating. Um, your skin just doesn't feel like it fits you properly anymore. Um, you, you, people will often describe that they're nervous. They can also have trouble concentrating. They can have sleep difficulties and they can have stomach issues. So um, a lot of times, I think people who have young children um, have heard their kids say they have a stomach ache and it's, it could be related to anxiety because they have a test that day or there's something new that's happening at school. Well, that could be the same for people who struggle with identifying what's going on with their body um, and that they're reacting to something that's happening in their environment and it's not necessarily just happening um to their to their to their brain right so it can it can definitely cause sleep disturbances as well and so when you see that people are ruminating and they have insomnia they have trouble letting go of something well again if you've ever taken care of a, a baby or an or an animal that doesn't sleep through the night or you've had any kind of illness that has kept you up at night what does your irritability look like the next day? What is your ability to concentrate on anything the next day look like? So imagine living in a continuous loop where you're not sleeping well because you're anxious. And then the next day you have more demands placed on you <clears throat> because you're, you're in, in school and the teacher's asking you to do something, but you lost half of the thread of it and you just can't focus and then you're falling more and more behind. So it can be this, this incredible loop um, that continues to happen for a person. So if you're looking at a student that has anxiety, what do you think it would look like? They're being quiet. Yeah. yeah. Or, or the opposite, like yeah. wicked chatty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Also distracted and... Um like not participating or withdrawn or like maybe it looks like they're daydreaming. Yeah. What about fidgeting? I have a lot of students going back to their phone. That's an escape for them. Yeah. They can try to escape. Absolutely. Yeah, that's like that evasive, like just like doing something else. Yeah. So they can be avoiding, they can be uh, fidgeting. So there's all kinds of ways that they're finding to self-regulate. So they can, they can shout, cry. They can be picking their fingers, their lips, their skin in different places. People fidget by tapping their foot and their fingers. They can wiggle around in their chair a lot. I, I know super young children that will move their chair a lot and get that vestibular action happening. You can see changes in their behavior. So somebody who's typically calm can be all of the sudden gregarious or the opposite. Somebody who's usually gregarious can become calm. Um, they can bite the inside of their cheek. They can pull on their own hair. I have a few clients that do that pretty incessantly. They can need to move around. They can chew their pencil or gum. They can be cracking their knuckles. 
They can be humming or vocalizing. Um, they can have inappropriate laughter and they can have silliness that's just really not in sync with what's going on. It's not an exhaustive list, but there, those are things you can also look for, especially with uh, guys with special needs. So what we do in, in our area is that we really look at when somebody is having um, a reaction or a behavior that seems um, not in sync with what's going on. We always wanna look at the function of the behavior. So, um, is the person doing what they're doing because as you mentioned before, they might be anxious and they want to avoid. So um, if they're disruptive in your class and you send them into the hallway, phew, <laughs> now I'm avoiding what was making me anxious and I get to go somewhere either quieter or where the demands aren't being placed on me anymore. And I've now avoided the situation that was causing me anxiety. Um, so you have to ask yourself, okay, first of all, what was the behavior they were doing? Be a detective and then look at, okay, what happened right before the behavior? Were there other people in the class that were being very loud? Were, was I asking the student to do something that um, should be easily accepted by the vast majority, but for some reason wasn't in that moment for them? Um, was it very crowded? Was it hot? Was it um, were they being asked to read out loud and that gave them anxiety. So think about what it is that was asked right before. Think about their reaction to it, their behavior, and then how, how, what was the consequence after that? So again, if they were asked to leave the class, oh yay, that's what they wanted. Or did you give them attention, be negative or positively, but did you give them attention for what they were doing? Maybe their behavior was based on on I'm feeling anxious right now and I want somebody to pay attention to me because I'm feeling like I'm jumping out of my skin. So I'm, I'm gonna get the attention whichever way that I can. So we always try to look at the ABCs of what's going on. Um, so in terms of helping people to manage their anxiety, we look at an approach that's the biopsychosocial approach, or in Quebec, we call it the multimodal. And in terms of what that means is we try to help people prevent escalation of anxiety. That really is the key. Um, we know that a lot of our guys with special needs, especially um, people with autism, are going to have trouble self-regulating. They're going to have difficulty in social situations. They might not understand everything. There might be a lot of, of stimulation in their environment. So we also, we try to look at the global diagnosis that the person is living with. Do they have learning challenges? Do they have a psychiatric disorder that's been diagnosed? Do they have sensory issues? Um, what are their vulnerabilities? Are they, just because their expressive language appears strong, is their receptive language equally strong? Um, or are they masking when they're speaking where they sound like they know what they're talking about, but if you really try to decipher it word by word, hmm, they've just learned super appropriate social skills, but they have really no context for what they're saying. So it's really to set up understanding what is the vulnerability of the person? Um, and then are you set up in your classroom to accommodate those needs? So it's not a question of, of what are you doing that you shouldn't be doing. It's more individually, if the person has trouble with um, the, the noise coming from fluorescent lighting, do you have ambient lighting as an option instead? Because they might have a sensory issue where they can hear the little humming of the, of the, the, the I can't remember which chemical is in the, those, well, fluoride, fluoride, I guess, that's going through those lights. They can, they can hear that noise and they can't block it out in order to focus on what's going on. So are you looking at everything that could be impacting on the person? Because a lot of times, their disruptive behavior might be because of that sensory overload. Or um, is there a predictable routine in the class? Is it somebody who has um, 
a, a tremendous need to be able to know what's happening next in order to feel secure. And if there's a lot of things that are, you know, let's let's just go with the flow and go in that direction because it's it's a student driven way of going. Well, that might work for some students, but that might also create a lot of anxiety because that lack of predictability can be something very challenging for others. Um, we also know that, for example, people with autism, having their routine visually available to them is a better way of reaching them than doing it verbally. That visual is reassuring, it's predictable, it's always there, it doesn't change. Um, and they don't have to do as much decoding as when they're listening and trying to interpret what you're saying. All right, guys, I'm going to shut the volume on that. Um, and also, if you know that you have people in your class that have anxiety or that struggle to manage their anxiety, how much time are you spending or, if any, teaching any kind of stress relief strategies? Because teaching somebody how to navigate their stress and to teach them a coping strategy for that can't happen when they're in the middle of um, having a panic attack for the first time. The best way to reach somebody is to teach them when they're already calm. So you can do breathing exercises, you can do yoga, you can, you can have a Zen moment. I have one of my educators that because transitions are very difficult for her clients, she has her smart board on with yoga style music and like waterfalls in the background. So as her students, as her clients are coming into the class, they transition in, she doesn't even talk to them. They know where their desks are. They hear this calming music. They see the visual of calming things. And that's how they transition before she starts making any demands on them. So there, there are ways to start teaching about transitioning and stress relief that, that are built in to your day-to-day. Um, another thing that we do, which is something I talked about in greater detail, is to really look at your observational skills. So if you see that somebody is fidgeting a lot more, they're picking at their finger to the point that it's bleeding, uh, or their lip, uh, they're picking on their skin anywhere, um, or they've become quiet, their, or their head is down, what's going on for them? So you, you have to look at what their neutral is when they're at their best, when they're able to, um, uh, to, to handle the demands of the classroom, when they're able to perform. Um, what do they look like at their best? And this is the optimal time to teach them their coping strategies. Then as they start to escalate, what signs are you seeing? Um, their eyes can be darting, they can be pacing, that rapid speech, that shallow breathing, the dry mouth, or as we talked about before, um, they can become super quiet. Is their speech perseverative? Or is their tone changing? Or did they, do they have a higher pitch now instead of one that's a little bit calmer and more melodic? Or the opposite. Um, when you try to redirect them, are they able to focus on what you're saying? Are they even able to look at you? So if you see that somebody is struggling and they're starting to show those signs of escalation, there's, there's a margin. And if you guys have taken uh, the crisis prevention course, if anybody has taken that, so the signs of escalation and the levels are de-escalation grid, what we use in our, in our area of uh, clinical expertise, it, it mirrors a lot of that. So um, at the first level of a sign of, of escalation, and this manifests, of course, differently for everybody, the best approach to use when they're just starting to show some saying, signs of anxiety is to show empathy and be uh, non-judgmental in how you approach it. So it can be something like, you know, do you think you, you'd like to have a drink of water? And that just that action of, of walking over or getting their water can help change their focus. Or even acknowledging you seem troubled, how can I help? Is there something I can do? If they start to, well, if they continue to escalate beyond that, if they're not able to be cued to those, those two types of interventions, 
um, and they're starting to lose rationality and self-control, they'll need the security of knowing that you are the person who is going to be in control, not in a bossy mean way, but in a very calm and supportive way. So they will need that extrinsic validation that there's somebody who's got them. So it's just, I wanna just differentiate between being directive and being bossy. Directive in the way that I've got you, it's gonna be okay. Let's go start your, your breathing exercises now. I think that'll help. So it's still supportive, but you're not giving them the choice by saying, how can I help? Now you're saying, let's use your coping strategies. I think this is a good time for it. And then at level three, um, I don't think you guys will ever get to a level four in, in your programs. At level three, they've lost enough control that you probably have a safety risk in your classroom. So you would need support from others to keep the rest of your class safe. Um, make sure you keep your distance, but also make sure that they don't have any items that they can hurt themselves with. And then whatever your protocols are in your individual programs, in your individual classes, you'll follow those. Um, but what's really important and what often gets to overlooked is that this person has just probably had a very traumatic and anxiety filled moment where they know they've reacted in a way that is not acceptable according to social norms. Most of them are gonna understand that and they're expecting or have potentially lived a negative consequence from that. So they need you to reestablish a therapeutic rapport with them so that they know that they're still in a safe place, that you're not judging them for having um, had that moment and that you want to help them not feel ashamed or guilty for what happened. And you want to just know how can we do this differently next time? I see that that was a big struggle for you. I'm really glad that it's over. Wow, that must have been tough. I think everybody was a little bit scared. How can we help earlier or better? What can I do to help you? What could you have done differently? So it's, it's making sure not to make them feel bad about it because then it'll add to the anxiety of feeling judged and not accepted the next day or the next time they start to have a moment of anxiety. You don't wanna to add to that loop. Does that make sense? So again, my little frog doing yoga, the best way to help people uh, manage their anxiety is to do what you can to prevent it from escalating. So um, tools that I had um, in mind are to have a visual schedule for the day or for the week. Um, some people though, if you, if you make it too big, especially people with special needs, if you give them a monthly calendar, that can also create some anticipatory anxiety. So you have to be careful um, I already have somebody who's been talking about Christmas for about six weeks now. And so we keep on, you know, giving different landmarks of when it's okay to start talking about Christmas is, yeah, after Halloween. And then it was, she calls it after the dead soldiers holiday. And now she's probably going to talk about it every day till Christmas. But um, that anticipatory anxiety, you also, you have to know your person well enough to balance between uh, when it's okay to give them a bigger chunk versus a smaller chunk of the visual schedule. Um, for many people, having a predictable routine will be really helpful, um, especially for people with autism, giving clear, concise instructions and giving them processing time is really important. Too much talk, 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 really difficult instruction, stop, let them process it. And um, at a transition, especially, you don't wanna be talking a lot for somebody who has autism that can make it much more challenging during that transition. Um, doing any kind of scripting or a social score story so that you're preparing them in advance for a change um, is helpful. And um, um, yeah, scripting and social stories are really helpful and they can be very general too. 
So some of the coping strategies that we would teach people when they're anxious would be reframing. And I just took, um, just in case it wasn't a concept that was familiar, I just took the APA definition. So it's reconceptualizing a problem by looking at it from another perspective so that it helps the person um, emotionally and conceptually look at it differently. So, you know, I know it's awful that uh, Johnny ate your lunch, but isn't it fun that you get to come with me to the teacher's room and we're going to find something different that I guess you never would have expected. It still makes you sad, but at least we found something good that could come of it. Um, mindfulness and um, is, is another coping strategy that we use. So that can be anything from practicing deep breathing, um, going to a quiet area, Using a visualization board, I really like um, um, using um, as many of the senses as possible when looking at something like a visualization board, especially if you want to use it for mindfulness. So one activity that you can do um, in an art class is ask people to paint or draw or collage with colors that help them feel calm. Draw calm for me. And then you can make a little two by four little laminated piece of plastic and use that little artwork that they did. And you can give it to them and cue them to it as part of their coping strategy because that little art representation, the colors they chose are colors that are calming for them, um, music that is calming for them, a sensory item that can help calm them because everybody is gonna have something different. Um, you can redirect them to an activity that they would find calming. So some people would like the, re the repetition of coloring. Some people like certain music and it can be, you know, headbanger metallic music or it can be, um, you know, yoga Zen music. Each person is going to find a different music that's going to help them. What surprised me a lot was the training that we had uh, years ago by someone from New York when we were learning how to use multi-sensory rooms, and she said she would take clients that were having huge disruptive behavioral um, episodes, and she would bring them into these multi-sensory rooms. And she would play metal music because she wanted to match what was going on inside of them with what, what was going on outside. And as they were in that room, she would then modify the music from, you know, going from heavy metal, maybe down to, you know, heavy rock and then to folk music and then to classical music. She would go through a process of changing the beat and the rhythm to match what she was hoping was going on inside of the person so that extrinsic calm could then be internalized. Um, so it's really important that whatever activities you choose are actually chosen by the student because it's got to be what works for them. Um, grounding is another approach that's used and it's to look at I think there's a certain number that you can use but working in special needs we don't usually ask them for five, four, three, two, one. We'll just say, ask them to start becoming more aware of their environment. So name, tell me something that right now you can see. Tell me something that you're hearing right now. What, what is it that's near you that you can touch? What can you smell and how do you feel? So it's to use all of the senses so it grounds them to being in the moment instead of being in their head. Um, some people are going to be at a, at a, a cognitive level where they'll, where they'll be able to talk it out. Um, other people will want something as simple as getting a drink of water. And also um, these worksheets, I, I think I sent you guys the attachments for in the last presentation, but you can use um, these kinds of pictogram type worksheets for people with special needs and there are others where there's little bubbles so people can look at what kinds of things make them anxious how does it make them feel and what can they do to help them manage their anxiety 
So I kind of thought that those were really good visual ways to help people um, understand themselves a little bit better and what the areas are that um, cause them anxiety and what kind of strategies they can use to relax after and to help them through it. All right, so um, we're pretty much at the, the part where, well, there were some struggles that people sent us. Um, Mark and Matthew, you gave me some questions in advance. I'm just going to share page one of them because there were two pages. Um, and I want to have a dialogue with you guys. If we can do this maybe as a round table, I don't see Matthew on my screen anymore. Yeah, I'm here. You there? I, I, I think that sounds great, Janice. If you read the, the question out and give your two cents and other folks can chime in as well. I, I'm also taking, Mark and I are taking collaborative notes on this side. So we'll be able to share this with folks afterwards. So um, you'll, you, you can just concentrate on chatting folks and we'll take the notes. Okay, fantastic. So um, the first question is a student who doesn't come to class or comes and sleeps, doesn't engage, creates a very negative aura in the class, but is able to hand in their assignments on time. Um, my two cents uh, would be, what does their sleep pattern look like? Are they depressed? Have they been screened for depression? Um, what other diagnoses might they have? Are they, are they willing to even discuss that with you? Is it something that I don't know how old your students are, but if they have their own, if they're apt, are they willing to talk to you about it? Um, because teenagers especially might be gaming late at night or even older um, students might be gaming late into the night too. So you never know if they're on social media, if they're gaming, or if they're ruminating and they're anxious and they can't sleep. And so then they do something to help them try to fall asleep. And um, so it can be a cycle. Sure, Mark, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, just so it doesn't sound like we're coming out of the blue. Uh, I used to, um, to help teachers with uh, classroom management and teacher induction. So I, I've, I've done a lot of reading and research on on uh, behavior management and on classroom management in general. Um, so yeah, so I wrote down uh, that, you know, speaking to a student in private, because I, I have more of a high school background. So speaking to a student in private, if, if the student is disruptive in class, then maybe just set boundaries and say, okay, this, this behavior is acceptable and this one is not, and try to find a, a, a way for the student to stay in the class and you set the boundaries and then at least they know you know, how far they can go or not go. Does anybody else want to add to that? Yeah, go ahead, Joanne. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with Mark, especially since in this case, the student hands in the assignment. So it's, it's you know, it, it's still a way of saying like, I want to stay engaged, but it can be like you said, like the other factors that are contributing to the, you know, general negative aura here. Uh, is the negative aura because they're anxious and that that's like they recoil and it's like almost like ah but I don't want to be here I'm just gonna like go to like a, a, a combination of depression and I just want to like crawl into the ground so I I, I would uh, agree with Mark that you investigate a little further like what's going on because like, like the, the student is still participating in, in their way. They're still handing in assignments. So they're still there. Mm -hmm. So they're, no, that's, that's tend to agree with that. Check, like investigate yeah. on a, yeah. on like what's going on, you know? Yeah. Exactly. I'm, I'm going to play a bit of a devil's advocate here. Is, so is the negative aura that the person has, or is it the negative aura that they're creating in the class that, hey, this person doesn't have to turn up, but they're still successful? As an academic teacher, is that hurting my pride that this person is managing to be successful without being in my class, without doing the assignment, like the homework and everything, but still is successful? It, I think there's a lot of the, the for me there's ambig ambiguity in that question. Now, I it, want to agree with you, Nancy, because that's the thing: is what's the what's the negative aura? Because if the student is sleeping, what aura are they? Degage, you know what I mean? So is but it because it, it, it's a bad example for the others? Yeah. Is it that it's like 
while you're like, you know, I'm feeling hurt. I like you said, hers are the teachers. So like, what's going on? Like, what is that? Like that negative aura is like, what is it? Is it? But on the other hand, not- that that student feels safe enough to sleep in your class. Does that not say something about maybe mm-hmm. what's going on in their life? Mm-hmm. But the fact that they can feel safe in your class that's an indication about the atmosphere you have in your class and maybe that isn't so negative mm-hmm. exactly. um and i mean if they're all sleeping you might need to work in your classroom management stuff but that's the thing is the student sleeping or is the two student recoiling yes because there's a difference not, yeah know, <laughs> yeah depending on what the student is man- like uh, experiencing they they may not want to be engaged and they're going to be like you know despondent recoil they don't want to participate with whatever is going on especially if there's social anxiety especially if there's they're being asked to participate with other or whatever talk to other students or whatever is going on so they may or may not be sleeping they might be (laughs) pretending to sleep because i am not all anxious people can fall asleep in that setting no you know, like in a classroom setting with other people watching them, they might they might be sleeping, but they're not. They're just, I'm recoiling. I'm not participating. Yeah. And I think if you look at the sleep, and I, I've got to say, I do have students who fall asleep in my class. It's, for me, it's a gentle tap on the shoulder and say, why don't you go and get some fresh air? Because mm-hmm. then if it is because they're tired, that's another question. And then you can hold the leads into the conversation. So, hey, were you up gaming last night? Were you playing? Or mm-hmm. did you have loads of, were your minds not stopping when you were going to sleep? So or maybe, or maybe they have a job yeah. also, you know. Maybe, maybe, they've they've, maybe they've got a young baby at home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. These questions were sent in um, by participants in, in the forum. So I don't have a lot of detail. Um, this is just a, a list of questions that were sent in and Matthew kindly put them in a PowerPoint. So um, in an email, so I just added them to the PowerPoint. Okay, well, the next question is um, that came from someone is what support can be offered to teachers to help them support adult learners who are struggling with anxiety? Um, so my, my short answer is, well, hopefully this workshop was helpful. Um, but there are also um, TED Talks on anxiety. I I find you can learn a lot um, about what it feels like for somebody to be living with uh, any form of anxiety, whether it's generalized anxiety disorder or whether it's social anxiety or or even just having uh, anxious moments. Um, Does anybody else want to weigh in? Sure, go ahead, Joanne. So this um, seems to be like a, a reoccurring topic. Uh, I don't know if it's a, you know, COVID related or it's it's just it's reoccurring. We seem to have teachers ask this question in other workshops as well, not just with SI students. And one of the things that well, a couple of things that we suggest is actually like addressing the you know uh, the safe spaces. So like if you're having some you know. You feel like you you just need to to take a step back. So there's a there's maybe a space in the classroom or outside of the classroom where the students can take a step back and just go and regroup. Uh, another thing uh, can be like providing like you know sensory stuff like you know maybe even fidget spinners, erasers, elastic bands, things that can help the student um, regulate their themselves. Um, some students might also have like testing anxiety. Mm-hmm. So give them things that are not academically focused, you know, like a crossword puzzle or some, you know, some something that will distract them and reduce their anxiety before they mm-hmm. start the learning. So like just face it, like face it head on and just like deal with it because the it it appears that this is affecting like everyone including me my peers like this is this is not exclusive to you know one clientele I mean the non-sleeping at night happens to like a whole bunch of chicks my age like this we're ruminating all the so I, I know I think it's address it and offer some of these strategies like like you would you know with children do it with adult students as well. Just, these are the things that you can do if you're, 
you know, even yoga, even like, you know, deep breathing moments of, okay, like, you know, let's start the day with breathing or something. So these are the tips that we're offering. I mean, going for a walk, having some kind of an exercise moment, in, and it, I don't mean like, you know, playing 20 minutes of basketball, but, you know, even just going for a walk and getting fresh air, if the weather is nice, just that change in atmosphere, just, just that can help. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I do like um, your, your approach, Janice, and I think that it, it works well. It's, you know, it's a question of of acceptance, I think part of it is is for the teacher to accept that the student, you know, the student's behavior as something that's that's a, a manifestation of anxiety, and that will go a long way to creating sort of a welcoming atmosphere and hopefully help to to reduce that anxiety or at least uh, the student will feel more comfortable. And that's what you were saying, Nancy. Like if students are sleeping in your class, will they feel comfortable enough with you to do that? Which is great, you know, and and that's going to help them to to try to self-regulate or at the very least it, it's not if you see it not as an affront to you that's because it's not about you necessarily probably not yeah. uh, can i just add i think when some of the conversations i had with my students more than the academic ones but they have to do the oral presentations for their English and things like that. I actually say to them, if you aren't anxious, I'd be worried about you because this for most people is an anxious causing situation. But how do you deal with it? We're gonna practice being in that situation so that you become comfortable with it. And we will, uh, uh, Giovanni, you were talking about exam anxiety. I've actually had a student, we spent 30 minutes just walking into the exam room, sitting down, breathing once he's got his breathing back going back out and we did this just as a way of to explain but it was about talking about this is quite normal for people to be anxious about doing an exam it's let's think of things that was going to work for you not having six coffees before you go and do the exam is probably not going to help your anxiety levels exactly does anyone else want to weigh in Okay, so the next question was how to deal with students that open us up to us about different personal family problems, family problems related, considering we live in a small community where everyone knows everybody, etc. Do we keep it for ourselves in order not to break the trust between us? So um, I can tell you that that's a question that's asked in in my sector as well. Uh, we do try to make sure that our, our clients understand that we're working with them in a professional capacity. If they're apt, uh, we can keep their information confidential as long as we don't think that there's a risk to their safety. So if they're talking about suicide, then it's a different ball game to, you know, my boyfriend and I are talking about having intercourse on the weekend. Um, so if there's a, a psychosocial issue and they are apt, they're an adult, um, we try to help them find psychosocial support through their CLSC. Um, and if their issue is that they don't have an opportunity to meet with their, like I'm thinking of a more remote community, a small community where people know each other, is there a place at school where they can meet with a social worker from the CLSC in a private setting, because um, I can understand that in some communities, first of all, you might not be able to get to the CLSC for an appointment. Um, and I don't know if schools will allow, if somebody's really struggling for their social worker to come to meet with them privately somewhere in the school. That's my two cents, but I don't work in education. So you guys might have a better sense. I think it's a lot for a teacher to carry, for one person alone to carry, and I think that you have to go elsewhere. So perhaps, you know, not necessarily naming the student to begin with, or just try to go and get other resources, talking with an administrator. Uh, there are things things that go outside of the classroom, and, uh, you know, teachers have, have it rough as it is. So to, to put that on, and that doesn't mean you should divorce yourself from the, the actual problem or the student, but maybe get some help elsewhere with the professionals or an administrator. Okay. 
Anybody else want to weigh in? I, I like that a lot, Mark. I think um, uh, depending on the setting, you know, especially if you're teaching social integration or alternative, um, it's heavy, right? And um, I think consulting with your 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 trusted trusted colleagues um, and administrators, um, you don't have to name the situation, right? Um, uh, even if there, you know, this aspect to respect that confidentiality, but you might need some support in supporting these students, especially when you're, you know, classroom, you, you may have multiple students who are dealing with really complex issues. So whether we're talking social integration, SVI or alternative, you know, quite often we have a lot of students who are struggling with a lot of things. So it's important to make sure you have some help with that too. You know, that metaphor there, putting your mask on first. Right, that meant something on an airplane. Now it means something more with COVID. But I think that's important. You know, when you're supporting your students, that you make sure that you know you're supported as well. Good point, for sure. Okay, the next uh, question was how to manage a student who's very unmotivated to participate. Um, my quick answer is always to look at the possible diagnosis of the person. Are they are they able to follow what's happening in class? Can they read the curriculum expectations? Are you able to reward them for what they do and build on their successes? Are you, can you build in any of their interests? Are you able to build in um, a first and then approach? So, you know, if you do, once you finish this worksheet, then you could take five minutes to go online on your telephone and you know answer your texts or check out TikTok or whatever is of interest to them. Um, so that's, that's how I would approach it. I'd always try to build on the positive and then build from a five minute participation to a 10 minute expectation and, and keep going from there. But I would build in something positive that they can control um, as, a, as an interest if that's possible. Well, I was gonna, gonna say just also, what are they unmotivated to participate in? Because if it's like a class discussion or something like that, is there some way that, like, is there a reason in particular that they don't wanna participate in group discussions or something? Is that something that makes them socially anxious? Or that's what I would be wondering is what, um, mm -hmm. or is it just in schoolwork in general? Like the, the next question, but yeah. And yeah. From the student. Exactly. Are you looking at their learning style as well? Are you looking at their their specific diagnosis and are you looking at their deficit skill set? So maybe the expectation of how to execute the task is working in a skill set that's so weak for them that they don't feel that they can accomplish it. I don't know. It's hard to know without more detail. Anybody else? So, sorry, that was my question, I think, unless somebody else submitted it. Um, and I guess like maybe a little bit more context is, so we have a student who is like struggling to be motivated to do things because they don't feel like they fit in our class um, and that they think that they can do like academically more challenging programming, but um they can't so it's like this disconnect between like reality and what I want in my head and so it's like how do you motivate like it's like if I say to you like Janice we're going to do this and you're like oh but I don't need this because I'm not going to be here in a month like I'm going to be in a different school I'm going to be in a different yeah. program and it's like okay but we I know that you're not, but you think you are. So like, how do I get, you know, it's like trying, I guess it's like how to reach somebody and try and be like realistic. I guess we, sh I struggle with that. I, I sort of see the three questions at the bottom of this sheet as similar in that, how do you approach a student who denies their learning disability diagnosis? Um, so I, I see it as a cluster. So again, it's it's looking at what their their deficit skill sets are, knowing for you to be aware of what their diagnosis is. But also, I would use it as an opportunity to come at it from an entirely different angle, um, because 
a lot of people in our society see learning challenges or diagnoses as having um, stigma. And it's very powerful for many people. Um, people can feel that they're less than and in certain cultures, they can be treated as less than because they have those challenges. So given that we don't know where their resistance could be coming from, it could be cultural where they, they feel very stigmatized and marginalized because of their diagnosis. Um, and they don't want to be seen as different than their siblings um, or their friends in their community. I would, I would, I think, try to come at it from a different angle altogether and have a different but equal conversation in the classroom and see if that starts to germinate some thinking that we all have areas that we need to work on and we may need certain help at certain times, but it doesn't make those differences um, in us uh, unequal to our peers and see if that kind of an approach from a social skill perspective can help them crystallize that maybe they can still learn, even though they're not in a setting that they think is really for them. I don't know. That's my thinking. Oh, thank you. I was talking, but I was muted, but I just want to say thank you. Okay. Um, we we don't right. have, uh, I mean, we're over time, but oh, um, okay. I, I wonder if we could take uh, one more question. Um, I, I think the next one is um, a complex, but an interesting one. There's a lot to yeah. unpack there. Sure. So um, any suggestions for supporting a student who has an unbreakable obsession with a staff member, following them around the school to take photos? We have an intervention plan. It's clear, it's consistent, it's meaningful, and the student agrees to it, and then they immediately break it. Um, my, my answer to that would be looking at their diagnosis first. Um, is it a, an official OCD? Are they somebody on the spectrum? Is it a sexual in nature um, habit where they're following the person because they have a crush on them? Um, also, I would, I would approach it from a perspective of teaching that people right now are getting a lot of mixed messages between social media where everything that, you know, when I was growing up was private is now public, um, including what people eat at every meal of the day and put post pictures of on, you know, every social media platform available. Um, and there's a lot of paparazzi where there's people taking pictures and following around celebrities and taking pictures of them doing a million and one things that you and I wouldn't even consider as, as media worthy. So I think it's also hard to teach the difference between public and private and acceptable society rules and not acceptable society rules when you see that that's what's modeled for a lot of our, of our guys and that to distinguish, well, why is it okay you know, for other people, but I can't do it. So trying to understand where that behavior comes from, um, always starting with the diagnosis first, um, because if it's, if it's an OCD, you'd have to approach it differently than maybe if their diagnosis is on the spectrum, but teaching them the rules about what is acceptable, finding a replacement behavior that is socially acceptable and meets their need, um, that's how I'd be looking at this. So what's the function of the behavior? How can we replace it with something that's more, more acceptable. Would you use that as a launch pad for consent discussions? Um, so all of that, but again, you need to know the diagnosis and the reason behind why they're doing it. Mark and Matthew, I, both of you. Uh, I like two things that you said, Janice. First of all, I like the idea of going from, you know, sort of a, an agreement uh, to upping it up the ante if you'd like a little bit and go okay well we've tried the intervention that doesn't seem to work maybe it's something more and then we're taking away the, the you know the fact that the student just doesn't want to do the intervention and we're going towards well there might be as you say a diagnosis that would have to be done by a professional um and then the other thing and it's going to come back to me i'm sure it will but to just say what no okay i forgot that's the that's the first one. We'll come back. 
we we got through a lot and the um like uh Janice and Mark uh shared before they they prepared some really great um answers to some of these uh questions um as well and so those I can share with you um so I've been building on those in the notes but I'll be able to share with everyone you know your yours and Mark's uh your and Mark's thoughts on uh the questions so there's some really good practical ideas and suggestions in there um and uh, yeah, so I'm going to put this together with Mark in a way that's like shareable and we'll be sure to fire that off to everyone so that you can, um, uh, you know, have, have those for your notes or share them with your colleagues. Um, I just wanted to say yeah. with the, the balance of the questions that are there, the one on ODD, oppositional defiance disorder, I have to say that that's, um, it's, it's a struggle for me as a working person as well to find a way um, to approach people with oppositional defiance disorder in a way that works for them because it's very counter my approach to life. Um, so reading up on oppositional, oppositional defiance disorders, if you just, even if you just Google it, that one is, um, is a really tough one. If they have any kind of self um, introspective abilities, um, if they're old enough, if they have that kind of emotional maturity, it's a very different ball game than somebody who's very adolescent in, in their approach and who, uh, yeah, one of my clients that I deal with, that I've had to deal with over the years, he has, it's been a huge challenge, but I can tell you that this is now somebody who two years after trying to work on social skills with him is in paid employment and the manager of the grocery store where he works just looks at him and says, I'm the boss, you're working here, we don't have time for talking in circles, you need to go back to your task. And he doesn't do a lot of the therapizing and explaining <laughs> that I would do. And he's employed for the first time in his adult life, he's in his late 20s. Uh, and I, I never thought that he would successfully hold down a job. Let's I mean, the jury's still out, but he's actually achieved it which is which is a first so um I, I would read up a little bit more on on that disorder for whoever asked that question I've had to consult with one of our psychologists for um this client and knowing the roots of where it came from so in this guy's case he lived with um, a mom who had an intellectual disability and had an addiction issue, and he was very much of a parentified child who had to learn to go out into the world and barter and bargain for scraps of food that were being thrown out at restaurants in order to feed his family um, as a young man, uh, well, as a teenager, actually, and he had to take care of his own mother before he ended up in placement and then worked his way out of that. And anyway, a whole host of other diagnoses and other issues. But all of that is to say that, that a lot of times that comes from childhood trauma that hasn't been healed and distrust of anything that spells authority. Um, and, and they've lived a life that often didn't show that they could learn to trust adults in authority, including their own parents. So if you think of it from that perspective, also being consistent is really important. Um, I'll show you my last uh, little slide here about anxiety. Um, just for you to think about this, somebody struggling uh, with anxiety, they need to separate who they are from their anxiety. So it's not you, it's something that's moving through you and it can leave out of the same door that it came in. So just, just as a reassurance to people who have had a, a horrible moment where they might've disrupted a class or uh, felt super anxious, um, really important to put in context that we don't judge them for being anxious. We see who they are and that they were having a moment of struggle. And that was it. Sorry, it took so long. Hey, we got through it. We did. <laughs> and I feel like we're just getting into like, now I'm like, okay, this needs to be a whole class. And I, you know, yeah. I feel like we're starting to hone into like some very specific examples that are helpful. And just because it's so unique, not unique, but it's not 
what we're working with adults, right? And a lot of the times, a lot of things have been tried and there's just like this exhaustion on the part of the, the class, on the part, of, on the student's part, the teacher's part, like folks have tried a lot. So again, but also you're working with folks who are kind of like, you know, fully grown adults, you know, yeah. it's different than from working with kids. Um, yeah. And so I think we're starting to get into that a little bit. So um, I appreciate that. And I don't know, maybe we're going to need, you know, a part three, Janice, to maybe. continue this discussion. Always a pleasure. Um, well, um, thank you so much for, for this, Janice. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your expertise, uh, whether it's me sending you a text in a panic because I need help navigating the service for someone or I've encountered something I've never seen. You're, you're so generous with your, your, your time. So, and then today, you know, it's almost 5.30, it's dinner time and here you are. So thanks so much for, Jan, uh, for that, Janice. I really appreciate that. And thank you everyone for, for coming out. It's an end of the day, it's an applicor. But uh, it's a nice way to end the day, too, after, you know, whatever it was you're doing, teaching, uh, consulting, or whatever. Um, it's, I'm, I'm appreciative of, of, all, of you all making the time today. And nice way for me to end my day anyway. So thank you. 